Hello, alongside Ryan, sir, I'm Don Helbig, and welcome to The Pick 6, the podcast by the Attractions Group, where we bring you the latest stories from the attractions and amusement industry. Ryan, how are you I'm doing? doing great. I love The Pick 6. Hey, before we get started, let me remind you guys that you can follow us on all your favorite podcast apps, Apple, Google, Spotify, you know where to find us. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, good for you. That's awesome. Smash that subscribe button, hit like, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs> All right, to get things started, our first news item on the pick six, Dollywood in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, concluded its 38th season and is now gearing up for the 2024 season, set to kick off a week earlier this year in March. Currently, efforts are in progress to convert the Adventures in Imagination area into the upcoming Dolly Parton Experience. Now, that's slated to open in May, and uh, Ryan, I am very much looking forward to checking that out. Yeah, me too. I, as I've grown older, I've come to appreciate the whole Dolly Parton aspect of of Dollywood because she's a fantastic artist. She's an icon, and she does so much good. and And I think that's what really matters. So I'm really, I'm really happy that her legacy, no matter what happens to her, will always live on within this park. But, yeah, and the more time I spend in Pigeon Forge, the more things that you see she is involved with in the community. Oh yeah, yeah, and it, it's it's funny, and I, I've always wondered what her involvement is with Dollywood because I was always under the assumption that she owns five percent of it, but licenses her name or something. But from what I've heard, from all accounts, that's not true. She owns most of Dollywood, so she really does have an equity position in that park, and she is some sort of decision maker. She probably leaves it in the hands of you know the people that know what they're doing. But uh, it, it's her vision when it comes down to it. So I, I, I just think that's the coolest yep, thing. She's, in, she's involved. Absolutely. All right. Moving right along. Uh, looks like that there's been some renderings revealed from the upcoming Lima Aquatic Center in Ohio. Strategically positioned outside Spartan Stadium, this cutting-edge facility boasts an outdoor pool, a versatile multi-purpose pool, a pool house, and an adaptable enclosure for year-round use. It's not a year-round use pool. It was a pool for everything else. <laughs> Anticipated to commence short, uh, shortly, the project aims for a timely opening in 2025, which is sooner than you think in a lot of cases because it's weird that it's 2024 already, isn't it? Yeah, just right around the corner. And, you know, you look at a place like Lima, um, it's good to have something like this, you know, where the locals, you know, have an aquatic center, uh, a place to go, things to do because – you want to go to Cedar Point, you want to go to Kings Island, you know, it's a little bit of a drive to go to those places. So it's great to have something, you know, in your backyard uh, that you can, you know, you can go to, you know, and just have a good time with family and friends. I agree, you know, and it's something you can do every day, you know, so it's, you know, Cedar Point, Kings Island, they're not think you can't swing by there after work, but here is certainly something. All right. That's right. Well, moving on, Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay is gearing up for an exciting Mardi Gras celebration. It'll start January 13th. Uh, visitors can indulge in flavorful Cajun-inspired delights, witness a vibrant Mardi Gras parade adorned with festive characters and multicolored beads, and enjoy live music throughout the park. Uh, this lively celebration is going to continue until March 3rd. Uh, sounds like something that uh, you, know, you want to see and you want to do. Yeah, I mean, Bush Gardens Tampa does a great job with their festivals and events. Uh, Mardi Gras is very low hanging fruit, and for a good reason. Uh, so I, I think that that's definitely if you're going to be in the you know Central Florida area, that's definitely something to put on your bucket list, don't you think? You know, I agree, and like you said, they do great events. They get a little bit lost in the shuffle there when you've got uh, you know Disney World, you've got Universal, you've got Sea World. You know, so in that central Florida area, it kind of gets, you know, takes kind of a back seat to those, but, um, you know, very much, you know, worth checking out, uh, you know, for the events like this or just any other time that you're down there because it's a phenomenal park. Yeah, I agree. Uh, great coaster collection there. Uh, I would say that it's uh, if you're if you're a roller coaster junkie, that's the one that's going to give you your fix uh, in Central Florida, more so than the other ones. Maybe a little bit of SeaWorld, but Busch Gardens definitely has the coaster collection. But 
Yeah, just a beautiful yeah, part. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's kick it on. Um, so next up, we're going to go to Alton Towers. So Alton Towers unveiled the name of its revamped Nemesis ride. Uh, the new ride is set to make a comeback this spring after a comprehensive overhaul. The iconic coaster closed in uh, November of 2022 for a significant refurbishment. Uh, it's the most significant refurbishment it's had in 30 years, by the way. Uh, it's going to have a brand new 250 tone, 716 meter track. Uh, teasing its return, the park released a captivating image alongside the ride's new identity, appropriately named Nemesis Returns. Nemesis ha has got to be on everyone's bucket list that hasn't been to Europe, right? Oh, absolutely. It has to be. And, you know, I've seen different thoughts on this name over the past couple of days out there on social media. I don't mind it. You know, Nemesis Reborn. I think that's it's appropriate. I think it fits. I'm fine with it. I, I, I'm glad they didn't just name it Nemesis or try to just rename it something else. I, I think I like it a lot, actually. I do, too. All right. Well, moving on. Big things are coming to Orlando, and we see the first step now. Uh, Universal Orlando has closed the Legacy Store in CityWalk, and the Epic Universe Preview Center will be taking its place. Uh, this change took effect January 7th with Epic Universe set to welcome guests for some or welcome guests sometime in 2025. Again, just around the corner. You know, we saw this when we were there a couple of years ago, you know, when things were just starting to go vertical out there. Uh, but uh, this whole, you know, new world, this new experience just around the corner, 2025. Can you believe that? It's uh, yeah, early 2025 is the rumor I'm hearing. So that's uh, we're at the point where it's less than a year from now. We They might be welcoming guests, but. Uh, Epic Universe is going to absolutely shake the foundation of Central Florida and probably the theme park industry because they're throwing everything they have at it. Very excited about it. Uh, you know, can't wait. I, I think every time we do one of these pick six, there seems to be some kind of a development from Epic Universe. You know, I know we've mentioned it many times. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there have been times when we have passed over Epic Universe developments because we've done it the last three weeks. But uh, a lot to be, I mean... So they, they, they footage got, I don't want, I don't want to say leaked out because I think it was taken legitimately, but, uh, they were testing a ride. Uh, so that's a huge step. You know, you can see the buildings, you can see the infrastructure, like it's all there. It was just dirt the last time you and I were down there for IAPA for this previous year. Yeah. What's all next? right. So let's move along back to uh, the home park, Kings Island. So Kings Island's 2023 season concluded last week. And this week, the park unveiled, unveiled details of its most ridden attractions. Unsurprisingly, roller coasters dominated the list, led by Orion, the newest addition, providing over 1.5 million rides. Additionally, five other coasters, including the Beast, Diamondback, Mystic Timbers, the Racer, and Banshee, exceeded the 1 million mark. Boo Blasters on Boo Hill. The Haunted Family Indoor Ride and the top non roller coaster attraction fell just short of 900,000 rides. 900,000 rides on that thing. Um, the park is set to kick off its 2024 season in April. So, uh, I mean, so you, you used to release this actual exact same figures every year. Are these numbers like really readily available or are they hard to find? I mean, the park keeps track of, uh, you know, the operations department, the ridership on every attraction. So that was one of the first projects that I did when I got there was just taking every year and just, you know, adding up the numbers. And it was always a great, uh, you know, thing to, to get out to the media because it's interesting, you know, the different numbers that you have, um, you know, so going back through, I mean, you look at, you know, 1.5 million, you know, leading the parade there with Orion for 2023. Back in 1976, the racer, 3.6 million. That's a park record for one year. So, uh, you know, 1.5 million, great. Uh, you know, but back in the day, the racer, you know, was where it was at. And no other no other attraction in the park's history is ever going to top that 3.6 million rides given in one year. Just not possible now. Uh, the technology has changed. You've got seat belts. You've got individual lap bars. You've got people bringing their luggage, you know, that they've got to check in when they get on the ride. Uh, just things like that. It's just a slower um, process dispatching chain, uh, trains. But, uh, you know, it's it, it's good to see that, uh, you know, they had that many rides surpassed the one million mark. What I would have liked to have seen 
in the stories that they sent out is just a little note how the two new rides, Soul Spin and Cargo Loco, did. I think that would have been interesting to see, um, you know, those numbers because the capacity is not, you know, as high as the roller coasters. But it still would have been nice to see what they did, you know, during the season. You could have said they were introduced in, you know, June and they finished the year with this many uh, rides given. And it would be a way to have circled back to what was new for 2023. But, uh, but that's okay. I think it's nice that they continue uh, you know, to share these numbers, you know, after my departure there and, uh, you know, keep the guests, uh, you know, informed as to, you know, what the most popular rides are by ridership. So uh, assuming that Soul Spin and Cargo Loco had really low ridership compared to these, do you think that the thought process for leaving them off was that the number just wouldn't appear that impressive? I mean, assuming it's in like the... Well- I don't think you can always look at it that way. I mean, I, I put out what Antique, you know, Kings Mills Antique Autos did. You know, that wasn't going to be, you know, wasn't going to cross the half million mark, you know, for, for a season. So I don't think that that's so much, um, you know, you can you can qualify it by just saying, you know, what the capacity is or, you know, it only had this many days of operation because it didn't open until mid-June. But I just think it would have been a nice way to just kind of celebrate their debut seasons to give them a mention like that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, well, honestly, it, it was kind of a perfect storm working against them for the opening of the rides because it didn't open with the park, which I feel like hurt. And then which I what I consider to be worse is that Cargo Loco opened before Soul Spin. So there never truly really was a real opening to um, Adventure Port. So I feel like the rides opened quietly and then uh, maybe this would be a good opportunity to circle back around be like by the way we got these two new rides but um yeah you just didn't hear about them much after you know you heard about them the you know when they first opened together uh with that there was a little bit of uh you know news stories out there and some discussion on social media and that but then the rest of the summer it was kind of a you know forgotten you know it was moved on to other things you know grand carnival was starting then you know it's the end of the silk city season now it's time for halloween hunt you know, Tricks and Treats Fall Fest. Now it's time for Winterfest. And then it's never, we're able to circle back to those rides. So I just would have liked to have seen that included. You know, obviously the numbers weren't going to be, like you said, impressive. Uh, but just a way to just kind of, you know, pay tribute to, you know, in their first seasons, these two new rides did this. And you could have said flat rides did this or something. Because in terms of flat rides, you know, how does it compare to the monster, the scrambler, shake, around and roll? You know, those other flat rides, you could have made that comparison with it. Yeah. I mean, it, are, are there any rides that have, like, th- were there any numbers that ever stuck out to you of, like, I can't believe this ride did this many people, or I thought it did a lot more than that? Is there anything that, like, sticks in your head that you remember from looking at the numbers that was like that? There were just some jumps some years, you know, with different rides that, you know, they would go from, say, 600,000 and, that, you know, all of a sudden it's got 850,000 or it had a record year and it had been around for 10 or 15 years. You know, so there were some things like that that would occasionally, you know, jump out that a, a ride kind of surged all of a sudden. And sometimes it would be identified, you, know, you could identify it because a new ride opened in that area. So there was more traffic in the park maybe there uh, or maybe, you know, something else, you know, came about that that helped it get to that number. So I was that was actually going to be my next question. So, for example, when Firehawk slash Orion opened, did it boost Flight of Fear's ridership typically? Like, since it draws people to the area, slightly, slightly, not not as much as as was anticipated by me. You know, it did not. But that ride too, it's again, it's you know, it's it's got you know, not the highest capacity. So you're not going to be able to gain that much, you know, with that ride. Yeah, but I don't want to say too many negative things about that ride because I love that ride and I would not ever want it to go anywhere. All right. No, but I just, like I said, just circling back to it, it just would have been a nice little nod. And, you know, like you talked about that, maybe you don't do it because it's not a million rides. It's not going to look as impressive. But when you put it up against all the other flat rides in the park, you know, and you qualify it that way and you make a comparison, you know, among flat rides, it ranked, you know, fourth, fifth, whatever it might have been then it becomes impressive. I agree. Cool. All right. So let's move on to the listener question of the day. So I guess I'm the one reading this one. So uh, this question is definitely directed at you. Um, So this is from Dylan Young. Uh, So he's doing Hershey Park for the first time. 
what's the ride to head to first to experience all the roller coasters in the park? So it looks like he needs a little bit of strategy. What would you head to first at, at Hershey Park? Well, first of all, Dylan, you're in for a real treat, you know, and not just because it's Hershey, but the park is uh, fantastic. Uh, so much to see, so much to do, just a number, you know, whether it's roller coasters, flat rides, uh, just a great collection of rides, you know, good, good food. You're going to have a great time. But the first ride to go to when you get there, go ride Wildcat. That's going to have uh, the longest line. It's one of the best roller coaster rides in the world. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, so I would go to that ride first because you're going to want to ride it multiple times, but at least get it knocked out quickly. Um, Candemonium. Got to ride Candemonium. That's one of the best VM coasters out there. I really enjoyed that ride. Ranks high on my list. Um, the Comet, you know, old wooden roller coaster. They've got new trains this year. Um, that's a can't miss ride. One of my favorite wooden coasters. Now, I have that a lot higher on my list than, than most people do, but I think it's a fantastic ride. Uh, some fun rides. Jolly Rancher. Um, you've got uh, the Lightning Racer. So, Dylan, when you enter the park, you're coming through the, the, the front gate. Take a left and ride Wildcats Revenge to start your day. And uh, then you're just going to have a great time riding all the other coasters and all the other flat rides in the park. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So you heard it here first. Wildcats Revenge. That's where you want to head first for your visit to Hershey Park. Hey, Dylan, shoot us a tweet at attractions underscore GRP once you go. Let us know how it is. We'd love to hear uh, your experience. I know I've never been to Hershey Park, uh, admittingly, but Don seems to like it. So very cool. Very sweet park from what I understand. All right. So uh, this wraps up another pick six. Make sure that uh, you can follow us on your favorite podcast apps, Apple, Google, Spotify, you know. Uh, you can watch us on YouTube. Uh, just search for the Attractions Group podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the little like button. Leave a comment and tell a friend. All right. Well, Don, until next week, this is the Attractions Group podcast. <laughs>